I'm a lot of people's first bio investment. I'm definitely their first dog drug investment. And so we actually dosed the first dog in that boo, a very sweet senior with it. And so that study's running. I remember the first time the FDA used the word health span in a response letter to us, we cried. It was an implicit acceptance of some of the ideas that we were having. It's reasonable to expect that our drug will extend the lifespan of dogs. It might improve their quality of life too. Hi, Della, my senior Rottweiler. I grew up with 15 cats, three or four dogs, all rescues. We had a dog named Highway we found on a highway. We had two puppies that we found as puppies that we named Puppy. Lots of rescue wild animals, the whole thing. The biology for a first-generation aging drug or lifespan and healthspan extension drug has actually been around longer than I've been alive. Uh, I was working at Longevity Fund and we were looking at the biology of human lifespan extension, and there's this one gene, growth hormone IGF-1, that's very well associated with lifespan and health span extension, everything from worms, even correlation data and people. And it turns out that gene is also seems to drive the lifespan and health span of big dogs. If you look at dogs, the bigger a dog is, the shorter their lifespan is. You know, my Roddy, who's 85 pounds, is gonna have a shorter lifespan than some of the tiny little uh, poodles that are hanging out in the other <laughs> part of the park. So those, you know, poodle might live 18 years, while my Roddy is only expected to live 10 years, and even bigger dogs might live, you know, eight or seven years. And this is strange. There's no other species where you see a 2x differential in expected lifespan. Honestly, most of the time as a mammal gets larger, their expected lifespan goes up. They can elephant versus a mouse. And there's only about six genes that control dog size. And four of them are in this kind of growth hormone IGF-1 locus, which is this kind of protein that floats around the blood and it binds to cells and basically tells the cells, grow, divide, grow, divide. And so the thesis of the drug is that when we selectively bred dogs or inbred dogs, candidly, to create all the breeds that we have today, we created genetic mistakes. And we accidentally gave dogs a genetic issue that causes them to grow very big, big in puberty, but also age faster and die sooner. Basically, it's an unintended consequence of historical inbreeding for size. But it was a very, I would say, robust thesis because this is happening in all these other model organisms and it's even happening in people in certain extreme situations that if we reduce the post-maturity levels of growth hormone IGF-1, that you'd make a big dog uh, potentially live longer. How can you drug it? How can you drug it effectively? How can you drug it safely? How long do you need to dose? When is the right intervention period? How do you prove that it's working? Nobody's ever tried to quantify health span, aging, lifespan in a dog in the way that we're trying to do it. And so the vision kind of came together that we could get the first drug FDA approved for lifespan extension via big dog short lifespan. And if we only do that, it's pretty epic. But it's also a really good way to learn more about how humans age via our best friends. One of the biggest why nows of Loyal was actually a change in the FDA regs, which made it both biologically possible to do this, but then also logistically feasible to build a company that's doing this based on venture dollars, which unless you're independently wealthy is pretty crucial if you want to do ambitious things. Basically, you have to hit the full normal manufacturing requirements, the full normal safety requirements, but you only have to show reasonable expectation of efficacy. You're showing that it's reasonable to expect that your drug is going to do what's on the label. And then once you're on market with that, you then run a full pivotal study to show that it actually does. Um, the FDA created this pathway to basically facilitate and incentivize the development of drugs where proving it would be very, very difficult. And so proving lifespan extension of a drug, even in a dog, is extremely difficult. So we're running a thousand dog, 55 site. Uh, it's going to be, as far as I'm aware of, one of the largest and not the largest animal health clinical trial ever run to show lifespan extension and show health span extension definitively. And that study is going to take somewhere between four to six years, right? And that's an extremely expensive study. It's an extremely difficult study. It's an extremely complex study. We had to design it literally from scratch. And so we actually dosed the first dog in that boo, a very sweet senior whippet, in December of last year of 2023. And so that study's running. If and when it reads out positively, allow us to be fully approved for lifespan extension. But with this regulatory pathway, we'll be able to sell before that study is completed under expanded conditional approval. So then the question was, OK, how do we prove to ourselves and to the FDA that it's reasonable to expect that our drug will extend the lifespan of dogs. The dossier itself was about 2,000 pages. It was extremely in-depth, it was extremely complex. 
We first ran something called an observational study, which means there was no drug. We took young, old, big and small dogs and pulled all types of biomarkers and health span questionnaires. So we did health related quality of life, which is a dog owner assessment of how active is my dog, canine frailty index, which is a veterinarian way of quantifying the quality of life of that dog. And we were able to establish in the field across breeds, across certain ages, across sizes, associations between different aging parameters, you know, metabolic fitness, things like that and their dog's quality of life. Again, it's all correlation, right? But it was really, really important because it was able to establish the FDA that this is not something that we're just seeing in mice, but it's reasonable to expect that if a dog has improved metabolic fitness. Hi, Charlie. (laughs) Oh, hello. If our drug improves the metabolic fitness of a dog, which Charlie doesn't need, um, but maybe my dog needs, that it's reasonable to expect that it might improve their quality of life too. Then the second part was, okay, does our drug do that? Does our drug improve metabolic fitness in dogs? But we ran these studies looking at both prevention and prevention of age-related metabolic decline and reversal of age-related metabolic decline in dogs. And we were able to show efficacy for that with our drug and within a dose that was also safe for the average dog. We don't want Della to take three pills instead of one and then get super ill when she's relatively healthy today. Um, so yeah, then we, we submitted that and it was just a lot of back and forth with the FDA. I was actually very collaborative. It's very fun. They're all scientists at the FDA, at least in the divisions we're working with. But then you send them, okay, here's all the code we use to run the stats. And here's all the raw data. And here's the individual dog level data. And they rerun everything. It's one of the reasons that process takes so long. You submit something and then the FDA reviews it for six months and then they give you feedback. And you submit it again and they review it for another six months. And you submit it again. And so we went through three cycles of that with the agency and earned um, the reasonable expectation of efficacy efficacy is kind of the I mean it's really hard (laughs) it's the thing that most drugs fail on and for us it was extra hard because we're going for a disease that nobody's ever gotten a drug approved for before we're going for lifespan extension we're not trying to develop a drug for cancer osteoarthritis which is very kind of well-trodden paths to go through the agency with that milestone was so important because it showed that our hypothesis that we had back in 2019 it shows that we're right can you sit please can you sit please good girl um I think one of the biggest things, it's actually paradoxically easier to build hard, hard companies, in my opinion. And and this is not an idea that's unique to me. It's obviously very difficult, but in some ways the path is super clear, right? Like we, we know where we're going. We want to get a drug approved and on market for dog lifespan extension. But the mission just makes hiring amazing people almost easy. Like really good people want to work on things that they feel like could be their life's work. And they feel proud talking to their grandchildren about one day. Same with investors, honestly. People love combinations where you can say you're going to make a lot of money on this and you're going to change the world for the better. Which the only catch is it might not work, right? But everything else is actually pretty reasonable. Um, you have to be perpetually humble. Like, I, I think I was like a pretty good like siege stage CEO, relatively speaking. But if I had not been super militant about re- recognizing each of my flaws and where I was growing and where I was failing, because even if it's only I'm a degree off, if you continue on a degree off, when the company grows and scales, you get much, much for a bigger delta from where you need to be. I think it is super important. Like if you ever let yourself rest on your laurels, especially when you're working on something like this, where there's an objective truth, an objective fact, like bio and deep tech will just like punch you in the face. You can't like make a drug work. Um, It really has to come from, like, how good is your decision making? I guess the biggest milestone we have coming up is we're running towards FDA marketing authorization of our first drug in the beginning of 2025. What that'll basically mean is that people will be able to go to their vet and get prescribed a drug to extend their dog's lifespan. And there's a lot of work to get there. We're finalizing the manufacturing. Commercial manufacturing of a drug is extremely regulated, as it should be. But of course, we have to get that final sign-off feedback from the FDA on that. So we're working on that right now. And then we're going to be doing something really interesting, which is, you know, most companies at our stage would go and sell to a big pharma company. You know, I really want to build a pharma brand that people love, but I want to build a pharma company foundationally, right? And so what do you need to do that? Well, you have to launch your own drug. (laughs) If I go and sell it tomorrow, we're not going to get to do any of that. So lots of work to do in the next year. (laughs) Oh, my God. I I think I've done like seven day weeks for like two years now. Um, But it's worth it. And it's super exciting. It's exhilarating, honestly. 
Loyal is a company I wanted to have on S3 for so freaking long. As soon as I heard that there was a young, ambitious founder that was building a drug to save dogs' lives and make them even longer, and potentially make human lives longer, I, I knew that was like a perfect fit for S3. The whole goal of, of why I do this for me is to inspire more people to believe that they can do crazy stuff like what Celine and Loyal is doing. And sometimes, especially in biotech, it's kind of hard to imagine that because it's so complex and the science is so hard. What I love about Loyal is that most people love dogs and most of everyone can understand that it'd be great to have our best friends live even longer. So despite how complicated what Loyal is doing is, I think this is just such a great bio entry point for the average person who is interested more in deep tech in this new age of bio we're stepping into. And also, you have to film dogs all day. The camera got licked, Celine got knocked over by a dog, you got to film in the sun. Really, really, really different than our average episode. It was a lot of fun. I didn't know how young Celine was when she founded Loyal. That's incredibly impressive to me. And then also in the interview, which is releasing tomorrow, Celine talks a lot about her background and, and how she got to founding Loyal and her unique views on biotech and the healthcare industry as a whole. It's really, really good. That comes out tomorrow and you should totally take the time to watch it because her takes and opinions are unique and expert. I'm so freaking excited for what Loyal is doing and this new age of biotech as a whole. I consistently feel like biotech is the most underrated part of deep tech and so few deep tech people I talk to understand it. And it's been a joy to do so many bio-focused companies at S3 and I hope to do even more and do an even better job of explaining it. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next week. And until then, keep on building the future.